I have gotten requests to take a look at this video right here titled David Cross, Why America Sucks at Everything. This was published by the Gravel Institute, which I have done videos on before. Gravel Institute, 294,000 subscribers on YouTube. This video has over 2 million views and it's hosted by David Cross. David Cross, who is, uh, you know, someone I admire as a comedian and an entertainer. And, you know, this happens from time to time. You admire someone, you admire someone's work and their achievements and their accomplishments. I have this problem with Leonardo DiCaprio. Leonardo DiCaprio is one of the greatest actors ever, arguably the best in the world right now. And he's made a lot of movies that I enjoy, like The Aviator, Django Unchained, and many others. Yet he uh, has this habit, he does this thing where he uh, gasses up his private jets, gasses up his big fancy yachts, which I don't have a problem with, but he gasses up these, uh, these private jets and these yachts and then he goes on around the world wagging his little finger at the rest of us and tells us to not burn fossil fuels because we got to save the world from climate change, folks. Dennis Rodman's another one, the basketball player Dennis Rodman. Played for uh, the Bad Boy Pistons. I, 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 I always found him as an interesting basketball player because he always focused on rebounding and defense and hard work. Yet, uh, in his post-playing career, he's, uh, he's made friends. He, he likes to fly to North Korea to play grab-ass with commie goon Kim Jong-un. And, you know, that's pretty unforgivable. So, you know what? It happens. Some, sometimes people you admire, uh, they, they turn out to have goofy-ass politics. Anyway, let's check this out. America is the greatest country on earth. The strongest, the richest, the most powerful country on earth. Hell yeah. As an American, I'm sure you've heard that roughly 135 times a year. 235 if you go to public school. Yeah, so we have public schools, he mentions. We have public schools. You got to keep this in mind, because how do these public schools get funded? And as it turns out, I don't know if you guys know this, according to some sources, the U.S. spends more on education than every other country. Maybe besides one or two, depending on the study or whatever. But you would think with all the money that America spends on institutions like public schools, we would have the... Uh, that our education system would be the envy of the world. But keep this in mind. 335 if you go to a Christian academy. We're told that Americans have the best lives of any people in the world. That we have low taxes, small government, and the highest living standards on earth. And most inaccurately, that we're the freest. Well, it is partly true America is the richest country, not just in the world, but in the history of the world. It's really hard to comprehend just how rich we are. We have 18 million people who are millionaires. America now, this is an interesting point because uh, Grovel Institute actually listed some sources for a lot of their talking points in this video. And one of the sources is this article to CNBC about how more than 20, America, 20 million Americans are millionaires. Here's how they got wealthy. And if you read the article, according to uh, Chris Hogan, he wrote a book called Everyday Millionaires, where he surveyed more than 10,000 of these millionaires. He found that these are regular, hardworking, everyday people. They're not flashy, Hogan said. Most of them accumulated their wealth over time by making wise decisions, according to Hogan. And I bring this up because I think this source that they cite kind of undermines the theme of this video. This notion that America, because of, you know, free markets, a lack of socialism, you know, there's just poverty everywhere and it's impossible for Americans to get ahead when if you read this article, despite any problems America might have, despite all the government regulation making it difficult, uh, more difficult for people to succeed, to get out of poverty, it seems like a lot of people, millions of Americans, uh, through hard work, through perseverance and patience, they, they achieve a lot. American households own about $100 trillion in wealth, an almost unthinkable amount of money. Okay, so America is the richest country ever. But there's a curious paradox. Most Americans actually have a much worse standard of living than people who live in poorer countries like Germany or Finland or Britain, but how can that be? Now, it's interesting because there's not a source for this talking point, and I actually looked into it, and it's really hard to find 
a source comparing the standard of living and quality of life of America to the quote-unquote poorer countries like Finland and the UK and Germany. And from what I've seen, it varies from source to source. The U.S. is ranked higher in some of these countries, in some of these rankings, ranked higher than countries like the U.K., Canada, Germany. In other countries, they rank slightly lower. The method of assessing these things um, is different from study to study. Some studies measure wealth inequality, which I don't know about you guys. I think wealth inequality is an irrelevant statistic. And uh, at the end of the day, I don't think these statistics really matter because even if the United States blew all of these countries out of the water, I doubt that people like Mr. Cross... And the goofs over at Gravel Institute would uh, would have a different approach, a different philosophy to politics. Because, as I've always said, it's really not about economics, folks. E, that shouldn't make any sense. Well, here's the shitty deal. Americans get significantly worse services because our tax dollars don't fund them. We get significantly worse services because our tax dollars don't fund them. Wasn't he just talking about public schools? How are those institutions funded? But uh, our, according to this video, our tax dollars don't fund services. Keep this in mind. So, of course, our services are worse. And thus, we enjoy less happy lives than people who live in the aforementioned countries. We enjoy less happy lives. Where does happiness come from? Does happiness, uh, I guess happiness comes from the government taking care of you. True happiness comes from the government taking money from you and giving it back to you in the form of uh, goodies like health care and social programs. Because, let's face it, folks. You're too stupid to take care of yourself and pursue your own happiness. Not that difficult a concept to conceive, really. You get what you pay for, said the cartoon dog to the other cartoon dog. And while you might think the reason American tax dollars don't fund as many services is because we pay lower taxes than other countries, that's not even true. When you add federal, state, local, and sales taxes and include other costs and services that our taxes don't cover but other countries' taxes do, like our uniquely high health insurance premiums, you'll find that Americans actually give away more of their wages than most of the developed world. For example, in Canada, for a married worker with two kids, all the previously mentioned costs combined. From so he, he says that, uh, you know, when it comes to taxes, the U.S., uh, we don't spend any uh, money on health care, on health services. When that is not true, if you look at uh, sources like Tax Policy Center, the federal government in 2019 spent roughly $1.2 trillion on health care. And according to the Congressional Budget Office, billions of these dollars go to things like Obamacare subsidies. So it is just not true that the he makes it sound like the United States doesn't spend any money on health care when uh, a huge part, if not a majority of tax dollars, maybe not the majority, but it's a significant amount of money goes to health care services like Medicare, Medicaid, Obamacare subsidies taxes to health insurance premiums make up only 11% of the average wage. In the UK, it's just about 26%. Meanwhile, once you tack on the cost of our outlandish health insurance premiums, you're spending a whopping 43% of your paycheck. Now, this comes from a source called the People's Policy Project, and it, it basically tries to make the point that uh, Americans pay, that, that um, the average American pays roughly the same amount of taxes uh, as their European counterparts and people in Canada, but we don't get the, you know, wonderful services like universal health care. And they assessed this by essentially taking the uh, uh, tax numbers from the OECD and adding uh, insurance premiums, uh, adding employee-sponsored uh, health insurance premiums to that statistics, counting it as a tax as well as payroll taxes. So they're basically counting health insurance as a tax in this uh, statistic, which I can kind of sympathize with this because they actually mention it, that the Affordable Care Act essentially put more pressure on Americans and businesses to either, either Americans have to buy their own health insurance or businesses have to sponsor the health insurance. So it is in a way more compulsory and this all started in the 1950s when the IRS and the federal government started exempting benefits like health insurance from income taxes. These tax incentives uh, created a situation where many Americans rely on their employer for health insurance. To the point now, after Obamacare, uh, you have uh, people counting it as part of the tax burden for American workers. What I found interesting was that they, um, 
despite the OECD reporting higher tax rates for Canadians, they got down to an 11% rate uh, for this statistic, which based on my limited understanding, the, um, this is only for married workers with two kids, as you can see in the graph. So if you want to, whereas with uh, people with no, with no kids in Canada, that they pay over 20% in taxes. In other words, if you want to get down to this magical 11% tax rate, if you're in Canada, you're going to have to take a trip to the boneyard, folks. That's more than France, Finland, Sweden, and Norway. In real reality, Americans keep much less of what we own than in other countries. In other countries, their government takes a bit more tax, but then gives that money back to their citizens in the form of health care or job support or a general safety net for all vulnerable citizens, no matter how dusky they are. So what do Americans get for the money we pay in? Well, sure, we get a So yeah, based on that statistic, again, Americans are getting health insurance. Maybe it's not great health insurance, but they're getting something for it. But David Cross and Grovel Institute want to make it th make it sound like you're paying all these taxes and you're getting nothing. Also, you got to ask, what's the solution to health care and health insurance and the uh, uh, the high prices? Crumbling infrastructure, shameful homelessness and millions of hungry, neglected children. But we also get some of the worst services in the developed world. Again, our health care. Now, it is worth noting by some standards, America has better healthcare services. America has the most innovation of any other country in the world, which uh, the rest of the world freeloads off of. And America, from what I've seen, has the be by far the best wait times uh, uh, when compared to other countries. And we'd probably have a lot more innovation and better services if we had a freer market in healthcare. American healthcare is simultaneously the most expensive, the least efficient, and the least effective healthcare system in the developed world. Hey, the devil's trifecta. And in exchange for this extremely expensive, inefficient healthcare system, what do we get? Well, we get some of the worst health outcomes in the developed world. Worst health outcomes. Notice the pivot there. He, he, he talks about the healthcare system and says we have poor health outcomes. We have fewer hospital beds per capita than people. Now, fewer hospital beds. Why is that? This is an issue that's been discussed ever since uh, uh, the COVID panic. Um, and it turns out that a reason why a lot of hospitals lack hospital beds is because of what are called certificate of need laws, which are on the books in over 30 states in the United States. These are certificate of need laws where care providers like hospitals, nursing homes and clinics, if they want to build extra space, extra rooms on their hospital, if they want to add supplies like hospital beds, like MRI machines and other supplies, they have to go to state regulators and bureaucrats and show uh, a proof that they need the thing that they want, and then the state has to approve them. And according to many sources, um, this was a reason for uh, hospital bed shortages, especially during the COVID pandemic. And apparently since the many states, as you can see here, this is according to Pacific Legal Foundation, many states have lifted the certificate of need laws on things like hospital beds because that was a huge problem in 2020. But according to David Cross, this is the free market at work. People in Turkey or Brunei, Americans have a lower life expectancy than people in Lebanon or Cuba. We have a lower life expectancy than people in Lebanon or Cuba. Now, Grovel Institute, lists the World Health Organization, as you can see here, as a source. And they've recently had to update this thing that now uh, the United States is tied with Lebanon. But even if we go to this source, it's right here. It's very convenient how they pick the statistics. Because if you just look at the life expectancy at birth, the United States is actually ahead of both Lebanon and Cuba. The statistic that they rely on is the healthy life expectancy. If you scroll down here, if you scroll down to Cuba... Uh, it is about, as of 2019, it's 67.8. If you scroll down to the United States, it's roughly 66.1. So Cuba is ahead of the United States slightly on the healthy life expectancy. And it turns out that this uh, statistic doesn't just men uh, measure mortality. It also measures um, morbidity, like diseases and whatnot. And when learning this, I could not help but wonder how much of this is actually self-inflicted. It has nothing to do with our flawed healthcare system, but rather choices that many Americans happen to make, like smoking, obesity. And I looked into this, and as it turns out, there have been studies on this topic that have said that the high prevalence of uh, obesity in the United States does contribute to substantially to its poor international ranking when it comes to longevity. 
I didn't look into smoking, but I think obesity would have a, a big impact. Now, I'm not saying that obesity is good, but obesity and smoking, these are things that are very preventable and very curable, and they're not something that you can just blame on the flawed healthcare system, which the Grovel Institute is clearly trying to do here. And in the Mississippi Delta and much of Appalachia, life expectancy- Oh, Mississippi and the uh, Appalachia. Is lower than in Bangladesh. Again, notice how they're conveniently shifting the goalposts. In fact, in 2000. Very, very picky with the way they cherry pick statistics and they're shifting the goalposts to make their point. In 2017, the United Nations sent a commissioner to West Virginia to document what he saw and he described, quote, third world conditions of absolute poverty. Un and I'm sure there are a lot of places in America where there are bad cases of poverty. In which case, I think you would have to consider why that is. Is it because of too much capitalism? Is it because of too much free markets, not enough socialism? If you look at a lot of these poor areas, which I've talked about numerous times, a lot of these areas are poor. A lot of areas like Chicago, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Milwaukee. These places are poor because of high taxes and strict business regulations that discourage business activity and economic growth that would provide uh, opportunities like jobs and entrepreneurship. Quote, we even have a higher infant. But it's easier to just throw capitalism right under the bus mortality rate than people in Russia and Serbia. In every single metric, America does worse across the board. In every single metric, America does worse across the board. Yeah, it's really easy to do that when you conveniently cherry pick data and constantly shift goalposts to make your point. Did you guys know that Americans consume more alcohol than people in places like Iran? And as a result, we have more alcohol-related deaths, more alcoholism, and more drunk driving-related accidents. Are you guys tired of America leading the world in these statistics? So why is healthcare so expensive? Because it's so complicated. Well, uh, it's largely due to government regulation, government intervention. And for those who, uh, who regularly watch me, you may have watched my recent video called How the FDA Saved Americans from Affordable Drugs, where I talk about the history of the FDA and its impact on the drug industry, namely the lack of innovation and the high drug prices. I even mentioned how Obamacare, uh, how Obamacare regulations, Affordable Care Act regulations, which again were designed to, I guess, make health care insurance and medicine more affordable, ended up making health insurance uh, more expensive. And even one of the books I cite in the video that I did on the FDA called Overcharged talks about how after the explosion of health insurance following the government's exempting it from income taxes, thereby uh, encouraging employers and insurance companies to get in bed with one another, um, health care was paid for before this health care was paid out of pocket and it kept it largely affordable. But because of that, along with the introduction of Medicare and Medicaid, uh, tens of millions of additional people demand for health care went through the roof. And health care is an area where it can be difficult to increase the supply to keep up with demand, because in order to get more professionals like doctors and nurses, you need people to go to college for, what, 8 to 12 years? But apparently, again, this is the free market at work, you guys. You have to look for in-network physicians, schedule an established care appointment, beg for coverage from your insurance company that couldn't care less about you, and that's if you're lucky enough to have good insurance. Compare that to Britain and all of those other evil, socialist-like countries where it's simple. Public hospitals provide free treatment to people who need it. That's it. I'll repeat that. Public hospitals provide free treatment to people who need it. And there are no trade-offs to that whatsoever. And here's the best part. Even though Britain offers healthcare for free, their system is actually a lot cheaper to run than ours. Per capita, a lot cheaper than ours to run. The healthcare spending in the U.S. is almost three times what it is in Britain. And, and a big part of that is because countries like the U.K., they ration their healthcare. Even Vox did a whole article about this called, In the U.K.'s Health System, Rationing is Not a Dirty Word. No surprise there. And they talk all about, they go into detail about, in all the ways uh, the government makes uh, decisions, they ration health care for uh, consumers uh, and patients in the UK. Going on to say at one point, but there's no system anywhere that does not make these judgments in one way or another. It's just that in America, they, uh, they do this by 
pricing uh, procedures that may be uh, that that may make it difficult for some people to afford. Whereas in the UK, you have government bureaucrats that decide which treatments and medicine patients are allowed to use. And as a consequence of this, uh, uh, the UK they have their hospitals are overburdened, and they have longer wait times. This is according to a story from the NPR. Uh, UK hospitals are overburdened, but the British still love their universal health care. And right here, the, uh, the author says that means drugs are now being rationed. Tens of thousands of operations have been postponed this winter. Wait times at the emergency rooms are up. If the ER is really busy, it makes the ambulances queue outside the front door not great. And in some cases, the hospitals are simply full. And according to a report from the, the Fraser Institute in Canada, uh, 1 million Canadians had to wait for medical treatment in 2017, costing about $1.9 billion in lost wages, meaning uh, roughly 1 million Canadians on average lost uh, about $2,000 worth of wages. Isn't this something that David Cross has been uh, talking about throughout the video? Lost wages? Due to taxes. Almost five times what Canadians spend. In fact, Americans spend the most. Now, the five times figure, this is something that Grovel had to correct if you looked at, uh, at their sources. Data, uh, data for Canada's per capita healthcare spending is overstated as five times what Americans pay. According to the most recent data, it's closer to two times what Americans pay. And as I uh, talked about in my video about the FDA, uh, what, ha uh, what happens when it comes to the issue of drugs is a lot of these socialized healthcare countries. Uh, they'll negotiate uh, down drug prices with private drug companies in America, and then these drug companies pass on the prices to consumers in the United States, meaning that uh, American consumers are subsidizing, essentially, uh, new drugs for people in these socialized healthcare systems. Per person of any country in the world for healthcare. But the free market is more efficient, you screech. But yeah. The free market is more efficient. I say we don't have a free market in healthcare. Again, the federal government has provided tax incentives for employers to provide health insurance benefits dating back to the 1950s, Medicare, Medicaid, the long history of the FDA regulating pharmaceuticals, the Unaffordable Care Act, Certificate of Need Laws, trillions of dollars in federal subsidies for health care and health insurance. According to the Grovel Institute, this is what the efficient free market looks like. You gotta be fucking kidding. But in America, private systems often aren't efficient at all. Private drug companies have an incentive to charge whatever they can get away with for pharmaceuticals. In Canada, a carton of insulin costs about 20 bucks. In the US, it costs 300 bucks. And with private insurance companies footing the bill, hospitals have an incentive to get as much money out of patients as possible too. In 2015, the average cost of an MRI scan in the U.S. was $1,119, but it was only $215. Yeah, and again, certificate of need laws are a reason why we have a lack of MRI machines in America, in, some, in a lot of American hospitals. Dollars in Australia. Spain, about 181 bucks. And our healthcare system is so inefficient that we spend over a third of our cost on administration. The United States spends significant... Yeah, we probably do. And again, a lot of that probably has to do with regulations, like certificate of need laws and insurance regulations. Significantly more on administration than we spend on preventative or long-term health care. That's just not smart. It's not smart. Maybe the solution is to free up the industries in insurance, drugs, and health care. Okay, we get it. We all know that American healthcare is so much more expensive, you say, but that's the cost of having the freest freedom in God's favorite country. Well, guess what? Medical procedures that are totally free in Britain, like giving birth, cost tens. He keeps saying free. Uh, I don't think he uh, knows what that word means. Tens of or he's definitely not using it correctly because he knows that taxpayers have to fund this stuff. Thousands of dollars in the United States. I mean, you want to talk about the cost of freedom. Sadly, because of these high costs, Americans often avoid going to the doctor, something almost half the population say they do. With shoddy or non-existent health insurance, Americans will wait until their conditions force them into the emergency room where treatment is far more expensive. Again, not a smart system. Quite often, they or in uh, these socialized healthcare countries, a lot of people they don't get care because uh, there's just not enough supply to meet the demand, or bureaucrats have decided, yeah, we're not really going to take care of you. They end up putting off medical visits and dying. Susan Finley, a 53-year-old Walmart employee in Colorado, got pneumonia and took one day off of work beyond what Walmart's policy allows. So of course Walmart's gonna Walmart, which they did by firing her. 
Without her job, she lost her nominal health care coverage, she struggled to find new work, and after avoiding a visit to the doctor for flu-like symptoms, she was found dead in her apartment. When America yeah, that sounds like a tragic story. Uh, not sure how true it is, but to the extent that uh, Grovel Institute isn't misleading us about this, maybe she would have been able to better afford health care and insurance if we had freer markets in these areas, which we don't. Americans do manage to get treated. They frequently can't afford it. Simple, life-saving treatments can cost tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars, and if they don't have really good insurance, they're forced to take on medical debt. Tens of millions of Americans owe medical debt, often into the tens of- Yeah, uh, and now he says this. When he says this, he wants to make it sound like that everyone who has medical debt probably has it because of a emergency life or death situation. And since he's bringing up anecdotal evidence, I have had medical debt before. I had to take on $4,000 worth of debt to pay for some dental procedures a few years ago. Got a $4,000 or $10,000 worth of credit at 0% interest for 18 months. Managed to pay off $4,000 worth of debt before uh, the interest rates kicked in, which was good. But I'm sure for a brief period of time, I was part of the millions of people with medical debt that he's talking about. I'm sure a lot of people uh, get medical debt for stuff like cosmetic surgery and other non-essentials. But even then, I think I would, I don't know about you guys, but I'd rather, uh, I'd rather take on debt and pay for it myself than uh, get taxed thousands of dollars more per year in exchange for shittier government run healthcare. Thousands of dollars. Meanwhile, in a country like Britain or Norway, medical debt is almost unheard of. But hey, that's why GoFundMe is such a critical component of American healthcare. One in three GoFundMe campaigns is now for medical bills. I'll repeat that. One in three GoFundMe campaigns is now for medical bills. America is such a strong, powerful, rich, and great country that its citizens have to beg strangers on the internet for money so they can get life-saving treatments that are free in the rest of the developed world. Yeah, apparently it's better for the government to force everyone to be charitable than it is for people to donate out of benevolence or goodwill. But hey, that's just healthcare. Americans get terrible deals wherever you look. Let's take work, for example. Americans work longer hours than people in any other rich country in the world, and that's not because they enjoy sleep deprivation and not seeing their families for days at a time. It's because they don't want to starve. I mean, uh, since again, since we're using anecdotal evidence, I'm sure a lot of people, I know a lot of people who work uh, well over 60 hours a week, not because they're on the brink of starvation or losing their house, but because they like what they do, they're motivated, they want to make money, and uh, that's their choice or freeze, or die. But even then, yeah, a lot in any system, people are going to have to work. That is a metaphysical fact of life. In order to survive, you're going to have to work. See, America has the least generous job support programs, the least generous family benefits, and the least generous unemployment benefits of any wealthy country. Cool. It's one of the only countries on earth that doesn't guarantee paid time off for vacations. It doesn't even help provide paid time off for parents who just had a child. And it's not coincidental that we're also one of the most hostile countries to workers' rights. One of the most hostile countries to workers' rights. I imagine Mr. Cross is going to talk about how places like California are trying to regulate private contracting out of existence, about all of these ridiculous minimum wage laws that make it illegal for people, particularly the young and the unskilled, to sell their labor below a certain arbitrary price point. And the fact that prostitution is illegal throughout most of the country, those kinds of laws, those kinds of uh, workers' rights being violated. America has one of the lowest unionization rates in the entire world. Oh, I guess workers' rights means you're part of a union. Maybe this deprivation, our refusal to give people the means to lead a good, dignified life commensurate with how rich our country is, can explain a bit of what we've seen in the United States over the last few decades. Fraying communities, rising rates of depression and suicide, huge numbers of deaths from drug overdoses. These so-called deaths of despair, suicide, drug overdoses, alcoholic liver disease, they're one big reason why American life expectancy has actually started to decline over the last few years. So a lot of it is self-inflicted. And with such poor conditions, it's- See, before he tried to make it sound like it was all because of the flawed healthcare system. Not a surprise that poverty is so rampant in the United States. It's rampant. America devotes a smaller percentage of spending on social welfare than any other industrialized economy because, say it with me, socialism is evil. You're goddamn right. You're goddamn right. Socialism is evil. It's evil. Go to Denmark and try telling those happy, healthy families. Oh, okay, the classic socialism is whatever Denmark has. Let's hear what the, uh, the recent prime minister of Denmark had to say about that. I know that uh, some people in, in the U.S. associate the Nordic model with some sort of socialism. Therefore, I would like to make one thing clear. 
Uh, Denmark is uh, far from a socialist plant economy. Denmark is a market economy. The Nordic model uh, is an expanded welfare state which provides a high level of security for its citizens. Yeah, it's always telling that uh, these advocates for socialism, they don't use examples like North Korea or Cuba that go all out. They go to the extreme on socialism. They just pick, uh, they just pick other mixed economies because that's what the U.S. is. It's a mixed economy, elements of capitalism, fascism, socialism. They'll pick other mixed economies that uh, they just do things a little differently. They redistribute a little differently. They regulate a little differently. And they'll say, see, that's socialism. America, we're just this uh, unfettered, unregulated capitalist hellhole. Whereas Denmark, they're, they're like, uh, they're, 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 they're a Karl Marx wet dream. When we know that is not the case. It's also interesting that he brings up Denmark right after talking about deaths from despair and suicide rates, considering that the suicide rate in the United States is not much different than Denmark and other European counterparts. So again, I'm not really sure that merely copying and pasting whatever they do in Denmark or Europe or Scandinavia will magically make the deaths from despair go away. Enjoying their pay vacation that their system of government is evil. Guess what? I guarantee they'll know you're an American. But I digress. America also has the highest rate of child- Also, not everything's hunky-dory in Denmark. Denmark uh, has the, some of the highest electricity rates in Europe amongst Germany. And the reason for that is, as I've talked about in previous videos, is because uh, countries like Germany and Denmark have embraced unreliable forms of energy like wind while being hostile to nuclear energy and fossil fuel energy. And you see places in the United States like Texas and California following the lead of countries like Denmark and Germany, and they're having similar outcomes as a result. I guarantee they'll know you're an American. But I digress. America also has the highest rate of child poverty of any developed country. And okay, the highest rate of child poverty. Greville Institute relies on a source from the Washington Post. What they discuss in this study, which was a, a, a report from UNICEF, is that uh, they define poverty as uh, child poverty as children living in a household that earns less than half of the national median income. In other words, this is relative poverty. The reason why I bring that up is because when David Cross talks about poverty, when you think about poverty, particularly child poverty, you think of a definition like this, the state of being extremely poor. You know, you, you might think of someone, you know, just having, barely having any access to food or clean water, clothes, shelter and whatnot. But what the rate he brings up is relative poverty. And the report from UNICEF even talks about this. It uh, Later in the study, it says real poverty it is often argued that relative poverty is not real poverty. Real poverty is said means lacking basics, enough food to eat, adequate clothing, dry home, an indoor toilet, hot water, and a bed to sleep in. Goes on to say, can the child poverty rate really be said to be rising, for example, at a time when the incomes of the poor are rising? And can it be really, can there really be more children in poverty in the United Kingdom or the United States than Hungary or Lithuania? If we go back to the article from the Washington Post that this video cites, you notice the United States in relative poverty, they lag behind all of these countries like Hungary, Poland, Greece, Italy. But again, it, this is measuring relative poverty. The rate of relative poverty might be lower in these countries by this arbitrary metric, but it says nothing about the standard of living. Further, even though the rate of relative poverty might be higher in the United States than in countries like Greece, Italy, and Poland, if the median income in the United States is higher than those countries, then many of the Americans who are currently living in relative poverty are probably richer than the people living in relative poverty in the countries with a lower median income. This is what many may consider to be an apples to oranges comparison. This is a context you might want to keep in mind when watching videos from sources like the Greville Institute. And the highest percentage of workers earning significantly less than the national median income. That seems pretty evil to me. 
especially that seems pretty evil to me again folks the the socialism versus capitalism debate is not about economics perhaps we should clarify what morality is if life is the standard of value and happiness is the purpose of life then what's moral is taking the actions necessary to sustain life and to live a good life. So politically, we should try our best to organize society around freeing up individuals so that people can take the actions necessary to live a good life through reason, thinking, hard work, and free trade. But it appears that the goofs over at Grovel Institute think that everyone should just look to political poll. They think that what's moral is that the state coerce everyone into providing everyone else with a certain standard of living. Because apparently, making force the standard criterion of human conduct is apparently the moral thing to do especially since such a tiny fraction take as much of your money for themselves and their families as you will let them. All the as a tiny few take as much money from you for themselves and their families as you will let them. Again, this is not about economics. This is a metaphysical statement based on a zero-sum view of existence. This notion that you cannot get rich, you cannot achieve without first stepping on others without taking advantage of others. Pretty sure that David Cross himself is rich considering his long, successful career in comedy and entertainment, which makes you wonder how many people did he have to step on and exploit to uh, make his money. Hmm. Really makes you think. A while both parties smile and shake hands. Across every single metric, no people accept a worse deal than Americans today. High taxes, high cost of living for next to nothing in return from the government. The most high, expensive healthcare system for the high taxes, high cost of living for next to nothing in return. Where does all that money go then? Most of the federal taxes go to Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. Much of the local and state taxes go to education and other social services. And I can't explain the cost of living across the country, but I know it's expensive in California due to things like high taxes and regulations that have prevented the housing supply to grow over the last few decades to meet up with the demand of the growing population. But again, apparently if you gave us the Denmark, the Denmark style uh, healthcare system and welfare state, I guess that would just make all the problems go away, wouldn't it? Worst health outcomes. More money taken from workers for the highest rate of child poverty. We are the rich- More money taken from workers. Just country in the history of the world, but we have fewer miles of high-speed rail than Uzbekistan. Good. We are the greatest country in the world. Tired of all these ta these uh, subsidies for rail uh, projects that go nowhere. Yet we have the most people in prison of any country and the highest incarceration rate as well. And a higher rate of- He may, may have a point there. We do have a lot of uh, laws, namely drug laws that- uh that result in a lot of people going to jail that shouldn't be going to jail. Police killings than in Angola and Sudan. America's bad at everything because instead of choosing to make life better for people through a public health care system or more generous child care policies or better public transit or programs that allow people to spend more time with their families, American law is designed and crafted to protect a class of parasitical middleman industries. Instead of using a proportionally tiny piece of the massive amount of the wealth in this country to make people's lives healthier. Using a tiny piece of the wealth. Now, first off, this speaks to how people like David Cross think. They just think that all of the wealth in a nation is just one big pie that's meant to be divvied up by politicians. When wealth uh, should not, is not, and should not be collectivized. It does not matter if you think you can spend other people's money on noble causes that, that you think would benefit society the implication being that it's good for everyone to have their money and property at the mercy of politicians who can seize it for whatever their pet causes but additionally the stuff that he wants is not just a tiny fraction even the most modest estimates for medicare for all alone would add 3.2 trillion dollars in annual spending which is again likely to be an underestimation and happier most of our elected leaders are and have been for generations engaged in a massive project of looting. Gently and lovingly guiding as much- This guy wants more uh, taxes, higher taxes, and calls other people looters.